hi, my name's Sean. I'm a research physicist who joined the dark side of the force, as I say, to study economics when an economist tried to manage scientific research. Now, physicists agree with each other pretty well in explaining what happens when a stone is dropped. But there are different and sometimes inconsistent economic views. Some see printing money, that's called quantitative easing, as causing inflation. The Keynesian would say that you can stimulate the economy at a time of stagnation when resources are idle. Others would say we can print money to reduce inequality. Today, I present a simple model, and physicists are into simple models, a simple model of an economic system that without any maths shows how an economy works, how we help each other by exchanging our labor, how we can use money effectively, and how tools and technology create massive wealth gains, but at the expense of using more energy. The core of an economy is about exchanging labor. I catch fish, you grow potatoes, and we swap, and we're both better off. Yay, fish and chips for tea tonight. If the dentist pulls out my tooth and I exchange produce with her, we both win. The value of a simple economy is the exchange of effective labor hours of the participants. A win-win exchange of labor provides us with the goods and the services we need to make us better off. An effective economy is about choice, not competition. The so-called invisible hand of Adam Smith that functions to optimize an economy works not through competition, but the effective choice of the participants. In a proper functioning market, I can choose whether to trade with you. Our well-being increases because we can avoid those who exploit us. I, if I'm not better off, irrespective of the level of competition, the market is distorted as it favors some over others. The emergence of sophisticated economies starts from the family as the basic, simple hunter-gatherer economy. Families enhance well-being by trading with other families, in the first instance, within a tribal framework. As tribes emerge and learn to trade with other tribes, we see the emergence of firms, cities, and nation states. Economies where participants can optimize choice perform better. Technology in the form of tools enhances the value of the uh, labor. Innovation increases the population. The carrying capacity of the economic system increases. A spear enables more food to become available. A plow allows a farming family to produce more, while the ox that pulls the plow eats grass rather than the food that we need. Dwellings, clothing, fire for warmth, cooking are all innovations that increase the carrying capacity, the population of the economy. The value of an economy lies in the hours of labor of the participants. Face-to-face -face barter is key to trading in a simple economy, but something is missing, money. While the barter economy takes place face to face, money, a form of IOU, allows trade to occur at different times and different places. It is a fallacy to see money as wealth. It just facilitates trade and investment. Something society esteems as valuable can be used as money. Gold, silver, bronze, or even paper I use. But in reality, Wine in a gold chalice is no more valuable than wine in a clay mug, other than the fact that we assign value to gold. But I need assurance that this IU, or IOU I use will allow me to obtain the same goods and services as if we met face to face. Barter re-emerges when inflation or devaluation reduces money's value. Better if the money we use, this IOU, has real value. 
Only some IOUs have intrinsic value. The value of diamonds, gold or paper is often based on arbitrary societal preferences. Someone dying of thirst in the desert would trade a bag of diamonds for a glass of water. When push comes to shove, exchange based on something with real worth wins. The daily IOU paid to Roman soldiers was a handful of salt. This came to be called their salary because it had real value. An anthropologist once told me of a Pacific Island community that used dried fish as money. Its value was real because it was tied to that of a real fish. Seeing money in terms of dried fish, a bag of salt, or later, a bottle of beer clarifies its function. It's a medium of exchange. Years ago, we belonged to a babysitting club where members received a credit for each hour sitting they did and a debit for each hour they used. The great and the good in the club's committee, mainly public servants, felt that solo parents were disadvantaged because they didn't have the ability to sit as often as others. So it was decided that these folks would be regularly given an hour or two's babysitting credit. The result was everyone moved rapidly into babysitting credits where all were looking for sitters, but no one wanted to sit for others. This outcome is called inflation. Because as the credits were not backed by an hour's labor, those who were desperate for a sitter offered two hours credit for one hour sitting, inflation. The club collapsed as to avoid inflation, the babysitting credits and the debits needed to balance. But a social contract in the form of a voluntary taxation where sitters donated time could have balanced the debits and credits, but no. Inflation occurs when the IOU, the credits, are not related to the actual output, the hours of production. Inflation is destructive, allowing the wealthy to steal from the poor. As wealth, acts, as wealth assets backtrack inflation, but incomes of the poor do not. It also steals from those who save and gives to the borrower. Deflation is the opposite occurring when there are insufficient IOUs to cover the economy's production, as seen in the following story. A depressed village. The pub was empty. As in the village, most people had no work and no money. The pub owner was delighted when a well-to-do gentleman came and paid a hundred pound deposit to book a room in the pub. The pub owner used the money to pay his debt to the baker, who then rushed off and paid the butcher, who paid the storekeeper and the farmer, and so on. At the end of the day, a group of one-time regulars came into the pub for a drink. The pub owner's heart sank. They couldn't pay. But they could, because sometimes money stimulates the economy. To the public and surprise, they all had money to pay off their debts. And... Uh, his take at the end of the day was exactly a hundred pounds. That evening, the gentleman returned to say he no longer needed the room and could he have his hundred pound back? Sure, said the pub owner. Now, everyone in the village was debt free and people started working again. Overall, a thousand pound of debt had been cancelled, but it was not obvious till the hundred pound note circulated. An IOU backed by a real commodity. The publican recognized then that if he wrote IOUs for a bottle of beer, he could trade the IOU to purchase goods. There it is, the Rogue's Nest Hotel, promises to pay on demand one bottle of beer, signed, are you honest? Eventually, the pub owner would get the IOUs back at his pub and he would provide bottles of beer for the IOUs and the village economy continued to boom until the clever publican wrote out more IUs than he had IOUs than he had bottles of beer. And just before the village economy collapsed due to this inflation, they asked him to be Minister of Finance, where he could do far more damage. The pub story illustrates the role of money. Without an adequate supply of money and without barter, 
people and factories can become idle in an economic downturn. As the economist, economist Keynes recognized, injecting money into the economy in such dire circumstances could kickstart it, but too much money leads to inflation, penalizing the poor and the saver. The take home message is money is not wealth. Inflation follows when increasing the money supply is knocked back by increased production. True wealth is in the farms, factories, schools, and shops that provide for our needs. But informed choice is key to trade. Advertising may increase competition, but not necessarily informed choice, as seen by the cigarette ad, real men smoke ace cigarettes. The consumer society is a consequence of people buying mainly through persuasion and not through being informed. And this only marginally increases well-being at best at the expense of wasting resources. So where is true prosperity? Some are become prosperous by stealing or by exploiting others. Some dig or pump wealth from the ground. Others work harder, slave at it. But the most critical and often ignored driver is increasing knowledge from the use of new technology. 150 years ago, 25 people could harvest a ton of grain in a day. Today, one person on a combine harvester can do it in six minutes. Technology firms produce 100 times more per hour than in bygone days. Technology amplifies the production of a worker. The market arguments about exchanging fish for apples are only valid if the technology is static. If it's not, the game has changed. A fundamental but ignored principle is that the knowledge good, knowing how to do something, is not the same as an economic good. Consider an apple representing an epic economic good. If I eat it, you cannot have it. It is consumed. It is gone. It is a zero-sum game. But if I share knowledge with you, we both have it. Knowledge is not consumed. It is the value of the knowledge good that has driven the massive increase in well-being in the first world nations. Yet most economic thought at best marginalizes and even ignores the importance of the knowledge good. Markets can't deal with the knowledge good. The elephant in the room is that a knowledge good can be shared at very little cost. I give you a fish, I feed you for a day, that's a market good. But I teach you to fish, I feed you for a lifetime. If you teach others to fish and they teach others to fish, we feed the world. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, there is, of course, a cost of um, having a skilled workforce and uh, sharing the technology, but it's negligible compared with the gains. The cost of sharing a knowledge good is nothing. But markets cannot deal adequately with knowledge goods. As markets are about exchanging things and consuming them, it's not that they're not about sharing. Now, knowledge underpins technological investment. If I forego consumption to save rotary hoe or buy a fishing net, I have more than you ultimately, or I have more than you now, but ultimately we're both better off. We all gain. Yet despite economic theories of the right or left, up or down, totalitarian or free, any economic approach that fails to recognize the significance of new knowledge is oblivious to the elephant in the room. That is the source of our increasing wealth. And key is nurturing an innovative culture. In the 20th century, literacy was essential to prosperity. In the 21st century, it is technological literacy. But how to allow all to share in the knowledge economy? Key is technological ed education. Now, the knowledge to make a car is known as intellectual capital. The knowledge was built over centuries from the invention of fire, the wheel, the knowledge to spell, spell, smelt metal, etc., etc. The total cost to build a car 
would be equivalent to zillions of dollars. Given that knowledge, the second car might cost only $10,000 to manufacture. 99.999% of the value of the car is in the knowledge to build it, not the cost of manufacture. And that knowledge is, of course, shared over all the cars that are built. Investment in intellectual capital creates new platforms of knowledge, and these uh, generate ever-increasing returns. The transistor was a new technology that replaced a vacuum tube, a valve as it was called, they little thumb light light bulbs in old radios and televisions. New platforms of investment arose from the transistor leading to integrated circuits, computer microprocessors, the World Wide Web, cell phones, tablets, new entertainment systems, medical technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, and on and on. Markets and investors find it difficult to value intellectual capital, yet it's behind everything. The most massive increasing returns from the, this new platform or from other new platform underpins the quality of life in first world nations. Now I want to return to an economist called Pity, Piketty. Piketty's second law of capitalism fails to acknowledge intellectual capital. The so-called law reflects that if I double my investment in two factories, my returns don't double. And if I keep increasing share uh, in true shoe factories, eventually everyone will have shoes and I won't make any money. There are diminishing returns in ordinary investments leading to stagnation, but not so in intellectual capital. The returns increase more as new platforms emerge. Piketty's argument is invalid for intellectual capital. His message of doom, that the wealth is accumulating to the rich, does not apply to the productive sector of the economy that is growing through uh, gaining intellectual capital. Uh, there's Piketty's book. Intellectual capital underpins the technology or tools that amplify human labor. The value of an economy now becomes the enhanced labor hours, the actual labor hours, each person's labor hours times the technology that using, the, 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 the amplification factor of that technology. And that's what makes us better off. The difference between a first world economy and a third world economy is not the GDP, that's just the result of it, but it's the increased return on labor due to the use of technology and tools. The knowledge economy increases the size of the pie. And even the poorest in first world countries have better access to education and health care and economic goods than their parents and their grandparents. My father, as a kid, was only allowed to eat the top of an egg because his uh, father needed it. He was a labourer. The economists, Solo and later Nelson and Winters, showed that 87.5% of US growth over the years was not due to increased capital replacing labor, as was believed. Rather, it was due to new technologies and the skill set to utilize them. As Paul Romer, a Nobel Prize winner, puts it, the value of cake is not the value of the cake is not in the products used or the labor, but is in the head of the chef. Innovators like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, or Elon Musk created new platforms of technology. Together with unsung heroes most of us never hear of, Berners-Lee and Kylio, who gave us the World Wide Web. Not because any economic theory said they ought to, but because they saw an opportunity. Today, billions of people are better off because of the knowledge platforms developed by entrepreneurs. Yet most economic approaches marginalize technology and innovators, starving the goose that lays the golden egg, believing that innovation falls like rain from heaven and the innovators just have too big, the buckets are too big. For example, the US president met with the United States automaker, automakers in August, 2021. President Biden lauded General Motors as leading the world in manufacturing electric vehicles. But Elon Musk of Tesla was not invited. 
Yet in the last quarter of 2021, GM made only 27 EVs. Earlier ones actually blew up. Tesla, on the other hand, made 303,000. General Motors EVs are subsidized by the US, whereas Tesla's ones are not. Elon Musk was not particularly happy. After paying $11 billion of tax in 2021, Musk tweeted that it was wasted, as it wasn't even enough to cover the $20 billion subsidy on fossil fuels. But there is a catch-22. Generally, economic theories see the economy as an equilibrium where economic forces balance. This is flawed. An economy is like the human body, a far from equilibrium system sustained by energy. Furthermore, contrary to theory, an economy is path dependent. Oil prices rise and then fall, but the economy may not return to its initial state. Rising populations and standards of living drive the economy further from equilibrium. But the technology that grows the economy requires more energy. The catch-22 is how to maintain the global economy at the present level of activity without increasing global temperature. In biological terms, we are fouling our own nest. Economic models, high, or this economic model highlights economic myths. One of them is money is not wealth, but only determines who gets what. Printing money improves well-being only if it facilitates the productivity of idle factories and idle people. But if not, inflation is inevitable, stealing from the poor. The greatest threat post-pandemic is, post is the careless printing of money. And there are economic myths, more economic myths. One cannot get something for nothing in an economy. Without increasing labor hours or levering off technology, printing money only provides the opportunity to kick start idle capacity. Lifting minimum wages at a time of economic growth can protect those at the bottom. But at a time of economic stagnation, this creates unemployment or inflation. Constraining or taxing higher incomes is a more effective way uh, of removing inequality than lifting incomes. But there are more economic myths. The first is that the market price represents something called the true price. No, not when market power suppresses choice, exploits people and the environment, and is oblivious to the future. No, the market can't actually hand knowledge goods or the value of intellectual capital. They don't fit market theory. Perhaps more state intervention is needed. Not when the state dominates the market, suppresses choice, exploits product, pe pe product of people, and suppresses innovation, or when the state ignores intellectual capital, thinking that innovation falls like rain from heaven. The state has its own agenda, as seen in the US automator, automakers meeting that I mentioned earlier. The private sector may be concerned with profits, but the state sector is concerned with power. And we have the investment myth. If I reduce consumption to accumulate IOUs to feed myself while making a fishing net, or you do without to lend me IOUs, the IOU is backed by something real. But if a bank prints an IOU for me without backing, I can buy food, but I don't have to give anything in return. However, if my net catches more fish, I can return my IOUs back to the economy. But if not, there are now more IOUs in circulation than the economic output. And you who fed me to make this fishing net are going to lose through inflation. Worse, if I purchase existing housing for capital gains through inflation, the investment is non-productive. And I'm stealing from the productive sector. And my nation, because of money printing during the pandemic, house inflation 
increased 25% in one year, and it's still increasing. I want now to talk about Piketty-nomics. Thomas Piketty wrote a book, Capital in the 21st Century, which claimed to sort out our economic problems. Thomas Piketty, by failing to distinguish productive investment from non-productive investment like housing, claims that wealth is accumulating to fewer and fewer people. Leading us, he claims, back to the times of Jane Austen and Charles Dickens, where there was a massive uh, layer of poverty in society. But Piketty-nomics failed to distinguish the success of the knowledge sector and the failure of the non-productive housing sector. And the following chart comes from Piketty's own data. We can see this in the graphs for France, its productive capital since World War II. Beta on the left-hand side is actually the ratio of capital to the total income generated, including salaries and so on. And here we see that for the productive capital, uh, this curve here follows about two to two and a half times the annual income. In other words, it takes uh, less than two and a half times the annual income to pay for the total assets of the economy. Remarkable, isn't it? It's, uh, there's a remarkable amount of wealth flowing through to other people. So society at large is benefiting from the productive sector. But here we see the non-productive sector, housing or property in the orange line. Property values are increasing out of proportion to production. And what's happening, wealth is being shifted from production to buying housing and it's existing housing. Piketty failed to show that housing was the cause uh, of his unearned wealth, not productive capital. And following the global financial crash, France, even as late as 2017, still had its uh, unemployment level uh, just hovering around 10%. France was investing in property, not jobs, and weakening the economy. On the other hand, the UK and Germany did much better. And here's another issue. Why did the politicians not listen to the 30,000 climate activists who descended on Glasgow for COP26? And it's quite simple. The scientific and the popular press failed to adequately discuss the actual economic issues that had to be solved for carbon dioxide emissions to reduce significantly. Did the activists know how to feed a population, currently 8 billion, increasing to 10 billion by 2050 without massive deforestation? No, it was not on their agenda. Many activists seem to believe the myth that it is all about controlling the economic system because that was the cause of the problem. They're in Klaukukulan if they think the economy will obey them, obey them. And here's a cartoon. Those who think global warming is all about targets are de de denying the economic difficulties that face us for the next 30 or 40 years. They are preaching a false narrative that divides society. So claiming by lifting the targets or thumping the economy uh, that we'll get somewhere is wrong. It just won't happen. We have to do the right thing. But no matter who is at fault, and yet there is no clear path ahead. Activists seem blind to the difficulties of reducing emissions without increasing global poverty or causing a world recession. And this video is actually because I've found myself unable to have a conversation with the activists. We will make no progress without engaging with those who produce in our society, those who give us the goods and services that we need to survive. As the major economies recognize that even with focused management, good management, currently we can only reach at best 60% of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Everyone should know this, but people deny it. This has been pointed out by a talk by Dr. Mark Carney. He's an advisor to COP26, and he was Reserve Bank Governor of Canada and the United Kingdom. And this, this, uh, these things come from his 2020 
wreath lectures, which are a must for anyone involved in activism. Carney argues that with an appropriate value system prioritizing societal needs, uh, government and the private sector can work together to develop the needed innovative technologies. This will encourage engagement through right action, not righteous activism. And so we now come to the conclusions of this talk. An economy at its core is about exchanging goods and services, facilitating choice for the participants. Wealth lies in skills, the physical capital and the intellectual capital of the economy, not in money. The critical importance of intellectual capital is marginalized in many economic approaches. And the issue is how to create and share knowledge. In times of economic stress, we need to nurture those who produce and deliver what we need. Otherwise, in anger, they will block, block our bridges and our roads. Thank you.